the Solar Alberta's 2023 Solar Show. Today's session is called the Alberta Electric System Operators Plans for a Net Zero Future. Please note that we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation and I see a few of you have already started taking advantage of that. And you can turn the captioning on in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. My name is Heather McKenzie and I am the Executive Director at Solar Alberta. I would like to take a minute to acknowledge that I'm hosting you today from Amiswichi, Owaskahegan, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homelands of the Métis Nation. Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of many Indigenous peoples, including Apaches, Nehewak or Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot, and Nakoda Sioux nations whose ancestors have cared for and nurtured these lands since time immemorial. Please note that we will be recording this session and making it available on our website and YouTube channel following the show. We were delighted to have so many people register this week for this event and actually for all the sessions this week. I think we ended up with uh, over 1600 session registrations so far and counting. To start, we'd like to thank the City of Edmonton Change for Climate for sponsoring the 2023 Solar Show. We're happy and grateful to have them once again as our sponsor. Today, we'll be hearing from Kevin Dawson, the Vice President of Strategic Integration at the ASO, about some homegrown pathways for achieving net zero. Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer period in which you can all participate. The entire session will wrap up in an hour and a half. As this is an online conference and trade show, I would like to encourage you all to check out our online trade show during the week. We have listed on this slide and in the chat all the wonderful organizations who are participating in the trade show. To view their exhibitor booths, which include a listing of key solar related services, contact info and video introductions, please click on the link in the chat. During our formal question and answer period, we will be using Zoom Q&A for questions rather than the chat box. So please enter your questions in the Q&A section. Also, please click on the little thumbs up symbols to upvote questions that you like. Before we move forward, we're gonna do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. Just gonna to click on that, launch the poll here. Give y'all a minute to start answering. All right. While some are still doing the poll, I encourage you to also take a minute and pop your name, land acknowledgement, and any contact info that you're comfortable sharing in the chat now and throughout the event so that others can look you up on LinkedIn and or email you and some relationships can begin to be formed. All right, I'm just gonna check on our poll here. And I'm gonna end that poll, oh, very good. And we'll share those results. We've got Quite a lot of curious folks here, which I'm not surprised because we are hosting this in the evening uh, in the hopes that a few of our solar and green building curious folks would attend. So welcome industry folks coming off, off uh, your hours. So thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And some students in the house as well. So it's great to get a sense of who's all here and uh, you're all more than welcome. All right, and now for a little about Solar Alberta. Solar Alberta is now in its 32nd year of operation. We are a not-for-profit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. We do so by advocating, educating, and serving as an industry and community hub for solar energy. Our membership is made up of over 360 individuals and businesses. To keep up to date on all our activities, please sign up for our newsletter at solaralberta.ca. We provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory through our website. In this way, we act as a bridge for installers, suppliers, and other solar related businesses to connect with their customers and clients. You can see a screenshot of the directory here on this slide and the link to it in the chat. In addition to our website services, we run a number of educational programs such as this solar show, as well as our seminar series and a number of in-person and online networking events as well. 
Our next online networking event is for women and non-binary folks working or interested in working in the solar sector and related fields. We are hosting this on March 8th over the lunch hour to celebrate International Women's Day. And we're gonna be hearing from Pambana's Benu Jekumar about her experience at COP27 prior to our networking component. The registration link is being popped in the chat now. Please note that recordings of the 2021 and 2022 solar show ses sessions and seminars can also be found on our Solar Alberta YouTube channel. In addition to some solar show workshops that are industry oriented, this spring we will once again be running a number of online courses for solar industry professionals or those transitioning into the sector. Our seven courses are online Tuesday and Thursday evenings on three to five nights over two to three weeks. You can already register for all of our courses at the link provided in the chat. Uh, also, if the course you're interested in isn't offered at a time that works for you, you can now pay to download most of our past courses and paid workshop content. These recorded courses are also available alongside that in our new solar training videos section of our website. And want to take this opportunity to engage you as Solar Alberta members. From February 6th to 10th, you can purchase an individual or student membership with a 20% discount. The link to become a member is also being placed in the chat. On April 5th, we're going to be hosting our annual general meeting, so I'd like to invite you all to sign up as members, attend, and elect your new board. There are four vacancies to fill on the board this year, so if you're interested in applying to serve, you can do so through our website until February 26th. And if you can't quite commit to board work, but you're looking to support our work anyways, you can also consider becoming a general volunteer. The link to sign up as a general volunteer is also being popped in the chat. And I see Gordon's here today. He suggested we should put an award show together. So we've actually gone and done just that. Thank you for the idea, Gordon. Not exactly what he had in mind, but close, hopefully. We're happy to announce that moving forward, we will be recognizing longtime dedicated contributors to solar in Alberta by gifting them a free lifetime Solar Alberta membership. So if you are currently a Solar Alberta individual or business member and you know someone who has contributed significantly to the organization or the solar sector in Alberta as a whole, please consider nominating them for this award. We're gonna be accepting nominations until March 22nd and then the award recipients will be announced at our AGM. All right, last slide for me. We appreciate everyone who has already donated to Solar Alberta. Donations like yours help to continue uh, our free programming as well as allow us to offer affordable professional development, at, uh, such as you'll see in this solar show. Uh, tonight, we ask that you also please consider participating in our 50-50 raffle. Uh, I think it's already over $790. And the raffle ticket sales were closed Friday of this week. And I'm going to be doing the draw live at 8 p.m. during the stories from Solar Sector Workers and Networking Night on Friday. Additionally, please consider donating through the crowdfunding link in the chat. The Government of Alberta is matching all donations made through this link until the end of the week. And now, without further ado, as this is the opening event for the Solar Show, I am delighted to welcome back uh, Elder Gatea Betty uh, Elizabeth Latondra, and she is going to be offering a blessing and land acknowledgement for us here today. It is her third solar show with us, and we're so pleased you could join us, Miss Betty. She is a traditional Cree Métis woman from the Papa Chase Band in Treaty 6, and is a direct descendant of Papa Stewo with lineage to Chief Big Bear. She grew up in the Northeast Imperial Mills, where her Cree parents, her first teachers, traditionally lived off the land. As a result of this traditional upbringing, Ms. Betty is grounded in her Cree, Métis language and culture. Her, her guiding principle is Pimatisuin, or Indigenous way of life, which refers to Cree tradition and cultural identity, a strong heritage, knowing where one comes from and therefore defining one's identity. Ms. Betty carries the knowledge and wisdom acquired through many years working with those who have taught her the ceremonies of her people, balancing her life from these sacred traditions. In her professional life, Miss Betty provides leadership to Edmonton Catholic Schools District, providing an authentic Indigenous voice. She also serves as manager of the Council of Elders for Edmonton Catholic School District. She is an honored professor working with the University of Calgary's Workland School of Education, 
providing knowledge and increasing the understanding of the calls to action set out by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Ms. Betty believes that when we understand the history of Indigenous people in Canada, we can then help educators make change. Ms. Betty has also held management and teaching positions with Health Canada and Head Start. As a highly respected Gitea, which is Cree for elder, Ms. Betty fulfills this role and responsibilities with humility and grace. She has served for many years as an Gitea to the City of Edmonton Police uh, Commission and to the University of Alberta. She also serves as a passionate advocate for children. Her vision is to help build a just and safe society where all children, families, and community members are accepted, nurtured, and free of discrimination. A world where all people work together towards a shared vision of humanity. She has been honored as the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Escuelo Awards in 2013 and 2018. And she was awarded a Guiding the Journey Award by Inspire for outstanding work on in, in Indigenous education as the leader of the Gitaic Education Society in Edmonton. She's also a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. Ms. Betty works tirelessly with a host of different government bodies, municipal representatives, and community agencies such as ours in striving to improve the lives of all Canadians. Ms. Betty, as I mentioned, has been with us for all of our online solar shows, and for that, we're really, truly grateful. So thank you, Ms. Betty, for joining us again today and I'm going to turn the mic over to you uh, now. Yeah, and Heather, thank you for the beautiful introduction and uh, thank you for making space for me one more time to uh, come and do uh, a bit of a land acknowledgement um, here at Treaty 6 and honoring all treaties from Treaty 1 to Treaty 11, all the Métis people, Métis nations across this country and all those who have come to live with us from many walks and there were different parts of the world who've come to live here with us and to make our Canada, our home, a much better place as we understand the history of Indigenous people, the many, many uh, atrocities that were once uh, inflicted on our people and to always remember the children that never came home it is with this that I, I say humbly say thank you for honoring me to come and just listen to me a little bit tonight and uh, that I honor you in my prayers um, that we are given this one life and today was another day that we're given this beautiful life where we woke up this morning and we you know got to open our eyes for those that for us that can see and hear and uh, feel our breath. And now we took our first step from our bed and that was a blessing, such a blessing for us. And uh, we got to see our families around us. And just to say thank you for that and to ask our loving creator to always uh, carry ourselves with grace and dignity and kindness, kindness that you can share that's free give that to other people so they will too have that uh, teaching of uh, showing kindness. Our children are number one uh, observers who everything that we do falls on our hands to teach them well and that whatever we do they are a role model. We are the role models. So with that, I say thank you, and I say a few um, blessings in, in my language, the Cree language, which is my first language. I suffer with English sometimes because Cree is my first language, and um, I humbly thank, again, uh, Solar Alberta for, for doing this work, and it's so much needed, and the more we can learn about it. You know, it's so much powerful that we always try to use all the natural resources that we've been given on this earth we call mother, our mother, the earth. So with that, I'll say a prayer. And it's just asking for blessings for all of us this evening, as we lay our heads down for a sleep this evening, that our spirit will rest and will be refreshed when we wake up in the morning. And that those who have passed on before us, who have gone to make a place for us, that we say thank you to them and they watch over us 
and that we are a true loving spirit from those who have walked this earth before we did. How in Mamutawe Mouth, the Batesagan, Kia Kaya, and the Pemia Ego Saki, Kia, Kadawemia Ego Nutawe, Ah, Tamagi Tawan Nutawe, Mesta Magayan Uta, Nista, Pichipatapian, Kapakanamo, and Gamio Asip, Uchina Nutawe, Akio Asakis Quewak. Na pesis at na pewa kaki on masum na nag no hum na nag muta ha oks magapsis ngataya agasim na sim na and with that we say thank you our creator however we say to choose God however that is for you just know that honor your spirit that lives in your heart every day and uh, go with my blessings and all that you do eksimaga. Hi, hi, thank you. Hi, hi, Miss Betty, thank you. Thank you for helping us start our week in the right way. I appreciate it, and I know many folks here do. And with that, I'm going to now introduce YC Ramirez, the General Supervisor, Community Programs for the Environment and Climate Resilience Section uh, with the City of Edmonton, uh, Change for Climate Program. So, Welcome YC. I'm going to turn the mic over to you for you to tell us a little bit about your program and to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm very happy to be here tonight to introduce the presenter for this event. But before I do, I would like to take a minute to highlight Edmonton's Change for Climate programs. So once again, my name is Weissa Ramirez and I have the privilege of working with the City of Edmonton's Environment and Climate Resilience Section. More specifically, our team develops and implements community programs and services to support residential and commercial energy transition and educational awareness of mitigation and adaptation activities. These actions are in support of Edmonton's Community Energy Transition Strategy and the Climate Adaptation Strategy. And these are um, one of the more sophisticated climate and energy uh, transition plans in Canada. The strategy requires uh, transformational actions from the city, its citizens, and businesses to dramatically reduce emissions and build the sustainable zero emission city of the future in which businesses thrive and citizens prosper. Through Edmonton's Change for Climate site, you can find the best, most inspiring people, projects, and actions being taken in the city as part of the energy transition and Edmonton's Change for Climate programs. Through powerful storytelling strategies, we celebrate the contributions that inspire um, increased participation and move our community towards zero emissions in transportation, buildings, energy, and industrial or commercial operations. The city programs include a variety of financial incentives, educational tools, and outreach opportunities to assist residents and businesses to take action on climate change. From our clean energy improvement financing to do-it-yourself videos and various other programs that help make Edmonton a more energy sustainable and resilient city by introducing the city's greenhouse gas emissions, reducing and conserving, conserving energy, and promoting local generation of energy. Your participation in these programs is essential to their success. So come visit us at changeforclimate.ca. More recently, um, you would have heard the budget process of the city concluded on December 16th, 2022. An additional 27 million was provided uh, in the 2023 to 2026 operating budget for environment and climate resilience. And this amount covers things such as community focused climate action, energy transition climate target actions and increased climate adaptation actions. We are working on the details right now of what programming will be rolled out. But we do expect there to be additional funding for solar rebates in 2023. Happy to announce that and very happy to introduce our presenter for this evening, Kevin Dawson. Mr. Dawson is Vice President of Strategic Integration at the Alberta Electric System Operator, ASO. Mr. Dawson is responsible for leading and coordinating ASO's activities related to industry-wide transformation, decarbonization, while ensuring a focus on sustainability. Oh, sorry, affordability too. 
Um, he joined ASO in 2010, serving most recently as director for casting and analytics, and has held the roles of director, marketing, design, and senior program manager. He has 25 years of experience in the electrical industry, and prior to joining ASO, Mr. Dawson worked with TransAlta in the areas of forecasting, risk management, commercial management, uh, portfolio optimization, and commodity hedging. He holds a Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in economics and a Master's of Arts in economics, both from the University of Calgary, and also is a chartered financial uh, analyst, a charter holder. So welcome, and now I pass the mic over to Kevin to begin the presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, YC, and um, thank you everyone for joining this evening and taking time out of your day to uh, to join us and, and uh, hear this presentation. I hope you find it very valuable. I'm just going to pull up my presentation on the screen. And uh, Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, I would like to, to start with uh, a land acknowledgement as well. And um, I'm joining you tonight from, from Calgary, which is located in the Treaty 7 region, uh, which is comprised of the traditional territories of the Tutsina First Nation, uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Ka'aina, Bikani and Siksika First Nations, the Stony Nakoda Nations, and is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, so we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work and, and be uh, it together in this uh, territory with many Indigenous peoples uh, from across Turtle Island. Um, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, start off by providing uh, overview of the Alberta Electric System Operator, which is the organization that, that I work for, um, and then provide an overview of some work that we have done over recent months to examine uh, the potential ways that the Alberta Electric System could achieve a, a net zero outcome by uh, 2035. Uh, and I'm happy to address any questions that uh, that come up after the the end of the slides. So a little bit about the about the ISO itself. Um, we are the entity that's responsible for the safe, reliable, and economic planning and operation of the Alberta power grid. Uh, and this is the the bulk electric grid. Uh, that covers the whole province and, and really uh, is the electricity system for the entire province. We are a not-for-profit agency. Um, we're created by legislation, the Electric Utilities Act, um, but we are independent of government and industry. So our board of directors is appointed by the, uh, by the Minister of Energy, um, but we are required to operate in the public interest we do not have any financial ownership or interest in any of the assets that form the electricity grid. So any generation units uh, or transmission infrastructure or distribution infrastructure. Uh, so we are really acting uh, in the public interest and in an objective and non-commercial manner. Uh, our funding for our operation and our organization uh, comes from the users of the electricity system, the ratepayers uh, on, on the system. And so we're funded by the ratepayers rather than the taxpayers. Uh, given our role, we have uh, a lot of visibility of electric of the electricity sector and a lot of information about um, what's going on on the grid and in the industry. A little bit more about uh, specifically what we do. We have uh, four key um, mandates that uh, we need to deliver on. So the first one is uh, we're responsible for uh, ensuring that uh, customers can connect to the transmission system. Uh, and again, this is to the transmission system rather than the distribution system. And I'll get into that in, a, in a, another slide. Um, but we're here to ensure that, that customers can connect and, and utilize the, uh, the transmission system. 
we plan that transmission system. Uh, we then operate the electric grid in the province, and we plan and we operate the wholesale electricity market for the province. Um, so those are the four main functions that we have as an organization. Uh, a bit more of uh, you know, how our industry is structured and, and where the ISO fits into things. So um, if you start on the, the, the left of the screen uh, where you would have your your large sources of supply or your large generation units that are connected to the transmission system. Uh, and those generators can obviously be of a variety of different fuel types and fuel sources, um, but they're all connecting to that large transmission system. So this is high voltage, usually 100 kilovolts or higher uh, for the transmission system. Um, and uh, there are also some large industrial customers, industrial loads that also connect directly to that transmission system and would consume load uh, or electricity directly off of it. Uh, and then the distribution systems, which then uh, essentially take electricity off of the large transmission system and distribute it to most customers across the province. Uh, so these would be residential customers, uh, small businesses, commercial customers, uh, some industrial customers, farm customers um, are all connected into the distribution system and um, distributed energy resources or DERS for short, um, which are you know typically smaller type of generators, uh, although some of them can be fairly large, like uh, in the tens of megawatts uh, and below are uh, often connected into the distribution system. And so there's consumers and suppliers that are also connected in that distribution system. Uh, so the ISO as an organization is primarily involved on the left-hand side of this screen um, in terms of dealing with the bulk uh, power grid, so the generation and, and the transmission system and the customers that are connected to the transmission system, and then interfacing with the companies that uh, own and operate the distribution system. Uh, so we're, we're primarily on the left of this screen, but obviously uh, need to understand uh, what's going on on the distribution side because it interacts with the transmission system and, and can impact both the operation of the grid and, and the market itself. Just a really quick overview of uh, electricity and electricity use in Alberta. Um, and so one thing to note is that Alberta has uh, qu quite a lot of industrial load uh, and um, a reasonable portion of that industrial load is actually supplies itself. And a lot of this is um, what we call cogeneration units that are you know, primarily associated with industrial activities, a lot of it oil and gas related, a lot of it oil sands related, uh, where the units are, they're generating uh, steam and heat and also electricity that is used in those processes. Um, and so we call those uh, behind the fence uh, generators and customers. And so the picture that I'm showing here is, is dealing with what's left over after uh, that behind the fence uh, customer and generation is, is taken into account. Um, and so these are what we call net, net to grid or really what is um, using the bulk electric, electricity system and, and really participating in the, the wholesale energy market. So on the left, uh, you can see that um, the majority of our generation, about 65% of it, is coming from uh, natural gas. Um, about 17% comes from renewables, so that would be wind and solar and hydro, I think a little bit of biomass in there as well. 17% uh, comes from coal and 1% is uh, from other sources. Um, and again, this doesn't include any of the electricity that's generated 
uh, behind the fence at these industrial sites. And all of that electricity basically is generated using natural gas. Um, in terms of electricity demand in Alberta, uh, Alberta is a, a unique jurisdiction in the sense of how large our industrial load is and what proportion of, of electricity consumed in the province comes from industrial users. Um, so uh, um, a, a little over half of what's on net to grid is still industrial users. Uh, and of course, most of the behind the fence use is, is industrial. So it's over half of electricity in Alberta and, and then um, uh, commercial uses, light industrial, things like that uh, are about a quarter. So uh, it's really about 25% of electricity uh, or, or less um, consumed in Alberta is coming from uh, the residential you know, sector, people in their houses and, and the farm and agricultural sector. So that's a, hopefully gives you a, you know, a quick overview of what uh, the ISO does, our place in the industry and, and some background information about uh, the, the general electricity market and, and sources of supply. Um, turning to the ISO's net zero uh, work and study. So back in uh, uh, mid-2022, the ISO released a report entitled uh, Net Zero Emissions Pathway. Um, it's available on our on our website, and I'm, I'm happy to provide uh, links to, to this later on. Um, and I want to walk through why we did this work, what we learned from it, uh, I'll, I'll take some time and do a little bit of a, of a deeper dive into uh, our view of uh, trends for electricity consumption in the province, um, distributed energy resources, uh, uh, and including uh, solar there, uh, and uh, the size and potential impact of uh, electric vehicles and other uh, ways that load is transforming because of this trend towards decarbonization and, and electrification. Uh, and then I'll end with a little bit of what's next for us in terms of uh, follow-up work and, and where we're going with this. So why did the ISO prepare this report and what, what is our report intended to do? And I'll, and I'll walk you through some of the findings of this report. Um, so we wanted to provide insights into interested stakeholders. And these are primarily uh, you know, people that are participating in that wholesale energy market, but it's also uh, you know, interested consumers, uh, interested citizens, um, uh, policy makers at uh, both the provincial and federal levels of government. Um, we, we felt that what was needed in the conversation was some Alberta specific information about uh, how this transition to a, a, a low carbon or a decarbonized electricity system uh, could play out and what the implications of that could be. So we focused on the operational uh, market and cost implications of, of a net zero transformation by 2035. And um, by net zero, what we meant was that um, we're really looking at a system where uh, if there is any physical emissions of carbon out of the electricity system, that those are offset by uh, equal volumes of reductions of carbon in the atmosphere, such that in the end, electricity is produced with zero net carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So uh, a big part of that is uh, producing much more energy with uh, no carbon emissions um, and to the extent that it, electricity is produced with carbon emissions and those emissions are, are offset. Um, we focused on 2035. Um, because you know a lot of the policy discussions around uh, net zero and a net zero economy focus on the fact that in order to 
really achieve broader net zero goals across the economy, uh, a lot of um, switching from other fuel sources, fossil fuel sources into electricity is going to be required and that electricity would be generated with lower zero carbon sources. Uh, and so most of the policy discussion around net zero focuses on uh, getting to a low carbon electricity system uh, by that 2035, 2040 timeframe so that the other parts of the economy can be electrified and, and we can achieve a, a economy wide net zero goal by 2050. Um, and so, you know, given those general policy discussions, we wanted to see, uh, you know, if Alberta uh, did want to achieve a net zero grid by 2035, uh, how could we get there and what those implications were. Given that there's a lot of uncertainty about um, the way that we could get there, uh, policies are evolving, technologies evolving, etc. We took a scenario approach uh, so we could look at you know, different possible ways and understand maybe some of the different implications from those different possible ways. Uh, the work would allow the, the ISO itself and industry stakeholders to identify what we need to do next and prioritize additional work and areas to focus on. And uh, we thought it was important to start the conversation uh, now, uh, understanding that, um, you know, under, understanding will evolve, uh, information will evolve, um, and that we would be iterating through, uh, you know, kind of constantly iterating through understanding what the implications of uh, transition to net zero were and uh, different ways that we could do it. But, um, you know, we need to start that conversation now so we can continue to gain the information that we need in a timely manner. Uh, one thing to note is we, we did not intend our report as a policy recommendation. It was not intended to say we should or should not have a net zero target or we should or should not have it by a certain date um, or we should or shouldn't try to achieve it in a certain way. It was really intended to provide uh, information uh, and understanding that um, could be uh, considered in those types of, of policy decisions. So a little bit more in terms of the, the scenarios that we looked at when we were thinking of these pathways. And uh, we do have a competitive, a, a deregulated competitive electricity market in Alberta. Um, and uh, so we wanted to recognize that um, the pathways to net zero uh, needed to consider that market structure and, and at least be uh, compatible with it, uh, with an initial assessment. Um, and we looked at three different scenarios and what differentiated the scenarios was increasing amounts of renewable generation from one scenario to the next and increasing amounts of energy storage from one scenario to the next. So on the left, we have uh, what we call our dispatchable dominant scenario. And this is a scenario where it's based more on um, generation types that are a bit more controllable in the sense that uh, you may have a, a fuel source like natural gas or, or hydrogen uh, where you can uh, control and, and have a bit more certainty of when that fuel is going to be available. Uh, but again, these would be low or zero carbon resources. So they're um, a, a little less uh, wind and solar kind of renewable resources in this scenario and a, and a bit more in terms of these other types of resources. And they were primarily natural gas with uh, carbon capture and storage or hydrogen fired uh, generation sources that we looked at. Um, going into the middle, we uh, had a what we termed a first mover advantage scenario and we called it the first mover advantage because what we see right now are um, some cost competitiveness uh, from wind and solar generation and 
quite a high degree of interest and in, in development of these resources on the system. So they are you know, some of the, the first low zero carbon generation coming on to the electricity system. So they're, they're the first movers. Uh, and if that uh, generation you know, continued to use that momentum and, and create a larger proportion of uh, the low carbon supply on the grid, uh, that's that scenario. And then our third scenario was uh, called renewable and energy storage rush. And this was our scenario with the highest volumes of renewable energy and energy storage on the grid. And um, we wanted to test this kind of a scenario to really understand any of the operational implications for when we're operating the power grid. And what we're seeing with the interest in development and the speed of development in the province is that we are trending towards this higher renewable energy scenario. So what did we learn from our uh, analysis? Um, sorry, just sorry. one second. Um, uh, what did we learn there? So first of all, there's multiple pathways to achieve uh, net zero by 2035. Um, there's a, a number of different supply mixes that could conceivably do this, but all of them are uh, highly uncertain in terms of the ability to uh, deliver these by 2035 uh, and uh, to do so in a cost effective way and, and with the uh, technology uh, risks still outstanding. Uh, and so we do face significant risk of achieving the goal of a net zero system uh, by 2035. Um, there's a lot of investment that would need to be undertaken to achieve this goal. Um, there's uh, a lot of infrastructure that would need to be built. Uh, and so that involves uh, regulatory approval processes, construction processes, et cetera. And as well, there's, um, you know, multiple jurisdictions are trying to achieve these uh, objectives along the same time frame. So there's significant risk that we run into supply chain uh, challenges, both, both localized in terms of uh, uh, within Alberta to, to build the generation that we would need and on a global scale to have the suppliers uh, be able to ramp up their production and, and deliver uh, all of this to various countries and jurisdictions um, all within really the next kind of 12 year period. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of risk of getting all of this done basically over the next 12 years. Uh, we also looked at the, you know, the potential cost of transitioning to a net zero system uh, and we did this relative to a non-net zero baseline. So um, we were trying to assess uh, if, if we didn't have any sort of societal goals or, or drive to uh, hit net zero by 2035, uh, that would be a baseline. And what would the incremental cost above that baseline be to um, get to these net zero supply mixes? And what we found was above that baseline, and, and we measured that baseline of over a period of 20 years. Uh, and so you can roughly think of that baseline as a, about $150 billion. Uh, and that's comprised of what we would have to spend uh, to, to build and maintain our supply sources, what we would have to spend uh, to operate those supply sources. So the, the fuel costs that would go into them, the maintenance of them, uh, and what we would have to spend uh, on the transmission system to uh, connect those supplies to the grid and move that electricity around. So even on the baseline, we're looking at uh, about $150 billion of those costs um, over the next 20 years, just to keep our electricity system functioning, basically. Uh, adding on uh, uh, net zero objectives would uh, add to that cost somewhere between 40 and $50 billion. 
Um, and so that's a, you know, it's a 30 to 36% increase in that cost. Um, the bulk of that is formed from uh, increased requirements to invest in generation capital. So um, to uh, essentially accelerate the changeover of the generation fleet would require additional investments in, in, in supply. Um, depending on the scenario that you're looking at, uh, you would face increased operating costs. Uh, and uh, we would need to build uh, out the transmission system to some degree um, to uh, get this uh, power delivered to uh, customers. Um, and I've got another slide later on that gives a bit more uh, breakdown of those costs. Uh, we concluded that Alberta's market structure could meet the, the demand uh, on the system, um, but that system reliability would be, would be challenged. Uh, and I will go into a bit more detail on that in a second. Uh, what else did we learn? That uh, demand growth, uh, even considering these trends towards increased electrification, and increased electrification would be things like um, electric vehicles, um, switching uh, heating from natural gas to electricity, um, producing more hydrogen in the province, et cetera. So we do expect demand growth for sure. Um, but Alberta has been a very high demand growth jurisdiction over the last 20 years. A lot of that driven by expansion of the oil sands and industrial capability in the, in the oil and gas sector. And what we see you know, going forward over the next 20 years is, is a slowing of that source of demand growth. Uh, and so that to some degree offsets the increases in, in demand that we see from these electrification sources. And again, I'll go into a bit more detail about uh, the demand forecasts that we did in subsequent slides. The other conclusion we had was that uh, in order to achieve a net zero system, we will require offsets of some form. Uh, and so this means that it's not practical from a cost or an operational reliability standpoint to have an electric grid by 2035, which doesn't emit any carbon. Uh, so in order to get to net zero, we will need to offset the carbon that's still emitted from producing electricity um, in other ways. Uh, and so all of our scenarios resulted in physical emissions. Uh, and so those would need to be abated through um, things which resulted in a reduction of carbon from the atmosphere. And, and so, you know, Examples of these things might be agricultural offsets or, or um, the planting of trees, um, et cetera, but we need some type of an offset. Um, and to give you a sense of the scale of this, um, historically, Alberta's electricity industry has emitted about 50 megatons of, of carbon into the atmosphere on an annual basis. And that would be say the 2015, 2016 kind of period. What we've seen in recent years is that that volume has decreased quite significantly, primarily due to the switch of coal units to burn natural gas, uh, the retirement of some coal units, uh, increasing volumes of renewable uh, electricity. Um, but that 50, megatons is now down around uh, the 30 to 25 range. And we would expect by the mid 2020s uh, that that falls uh, even further into the into the 20 uh, or below range. And our reference case, uh, e even without any kind of a net zero target, in 2035 had the Alberta electric grid emitting just under 18 megatons of carbon. 
our net zero scenarios all kind of hover between four and five megatons of, of carbon. Uh, so we, we do see a significant reduction from, from our non-net zero case, but still see these physical emissions. We also did look at, um, at or consider other ways that as a system we could achieve net zero. And um, we looked at uh, things like um, increasing hydroelectric generation, the potential for nuclear generation, increased connections with other jurisdictions, et cetera. And uh, th these technologies are, are possible low carbon generation, but we didn't view them as, as practical on the timeline of 2035 for making a material uh, re reduction in uh, emissions from the grid. And so uh, it's not to say that, that some of these things uh, couldn't happen. Uh, they may even happen prior to 2035, but we, we really see that uh, these technologies either need to develop uh, further have a high capital cost and so are, are fairly difficult to finance and get constructed um, or would resolve would, re would require significant uh, coordination uh, between provinces and jurisdictions to say, for example, increase um, our intertie capability between jurisdictions. Um, and that would require additional regulatory processes and, and then also involve construction timelines. So, um, our scenarios don't reflect uh, these technologies to a material degree, um, but we do see them, you know, they're potential technologies that may come into the grid or, or help reduce carbon emissions uh, post that 2035 timeframe. Uh, I, I know you probably won't be able to see all these numbers, but this just gives you a, a, a quick overview of the results in our different scenarios. And I just want to point out a couple of things that I think will be of interest uh, to this audience. And the first one is around uh, the volumes of solar that uh, we see in our forecast. And, uh, you know, for grounding right now, we've got, um, I think about 1200 megawatts of solar on our grid. It's grown significantly in the last uh, even year. Um, and our scenarios range anywhere from uh, 18 or 1900 megawatts of solar in total by 2035 up to just under 3800 megawatts of solar by 2035. And that's just a transmission system connected solar. Uh, on the distribution side, we see in all of our scenarios about another 2000 megawatts of solar there. So uh, combined in our highest uh, renewable and storage rush case, uh, that's, um, you know, it's about 5,700 megawatts of solar electricity on, on the grid by 2035. So that's significant growth uh, potential. Uh, and that scenario also has about, uh, just under 9,500 megawatts of, of wind. Um, and we're in the three to 4,000 megawatt range uh, at the moment and, and more being constructed and added every day. So significant growth in renewables in that scenario over the next uh, 12 years uh, in, in that uh, scenario that again, what we're seeing in terms of interest of coming onto the grid is, um, closer to this first mover advantage or renewables and storage rush uh, scenarios. Uh, to put this in other terms, uh, what do these scenarios mean in terms of renewable generation uh, that we see in Alberta in different timeframes? And we, we measure this in a couple of different ways. There's uh, one way to measure is to look at, um, of all the electricity generated in Alberta, what portion could come from renewables. Uh, and our scenarios in 2035 range from uh, just over 20, 25% in the low case to uh, about 45% in the high case. Um, another way to look at this is, and that's 
all electricity generated in the province. So 25 to 45 percent of all electricity generated in the province in 2035 could be from renewables, wind, solar, hydro. Uh, another way to look at that is um, what proportion of the load being served on the grid. So excluding these industrial sites that have their own supply and are supplied behind the fence. So that's a that's a smaller amount of load. Uh, when you look at 2035, we see that you know anywhere from about 35 to 65 percent of that load on the system that's not this behind the fence industrial load could be being served by renewables, uh, you know, 12 years from now. And uh, to put that in context, you, you know, that was it's. A, about depending on the year and the time, et cetera, you know, right now we're around 15% and it kind of hovers between 10 and 20% on a daily basis. Um, in terms of cost, uh, really what this shows is the breakdown of cost between the different scenarios uh, and our, and our non-net zero reference case. That's the case on the right. Uh, and as you would expect, in different scenarios, the makeup of the costs is is different. So in a in a case where you've got uh, more renewable generation, the renewable and storage rush case, uh, your operating costs are lower because a lot of your generation is free fuel sources. Uh, there's still maintenance, et cetera, and there's still uh, generation sources that are are not renewable that require uh, natural gas or hydrogen to be burned. Um, but the uh, there is a greater requirement to invest in generation capital because uh, you know typically uh, the 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 production from a renewable resource, uh, you know depending on what you're looking at, if it's a solar facility, you're in the mid 20 percent of of the capacity on average is is producing energy. Obviously, that varies from zero up to 100%, depending on the conditions. And in a wind farm, it's you know 45 or 50%. Uh, and so you do need to build more generation capacity uh, in that case, and you save some of it on the fuel side. Uh, and with that higher amount of generation that's being built, there's a little bit more transmission that needs to be built. But generally, between the scenarios, the, the overall costs are, are quite close. It's just the components that are changing. Uh, a little bit on reliability. Um, as I said, we, we looked at, uh, in these net zero scenarios, will we have enough supply to meet our demand? And uh, it's possible that the market delivers enough supply to meet the demand. Um, but there's a lot of considerations and risks to that. So obviously we need uh, pretty good alignment of when generation comes into the market versus uh, when existing generation retires. Uh, we need uh, some of the characteristics that are provided by existing gas fire generators. Um, you know, the fact that they can be dispatched up and down on demand uh, and some of the other characteristics that they provide to the grid uh, are important for reliability. And so if those, uh, we call them unabated gas units, so units that are emitting carbon uh, without any kind of carbon capture, or any other mechanism to try to abate their carbon emissions, if those uh, units exit the market, and aren't replaced by generation that has similar operating characteristics, the uh, high degree of availability, the ability to dispatch up and down, some of the other electrical uh, capabilities that they provide, then that will cause reliability issues. Um, when we look at uh, what can decrease the risk of uh, having insufficient supply, the uh, ability for demand to respond and become more flexible can significantly decrease that risk. So, and this is demand that's uh, really responding voluntarily. So other demands, uh, other, other load on the system that uh, maybe can't make those changes can continue to be 
uh, supplied. Uh, when we have these high renewable cases, we do see the importance of also having uh, quite a lot of energy storage on the grid to balance out these high renewable cases. Uh, um, and we also have looked at other aspects of reliabilities beyond just whether we'll have sufficient supply to meet the demand, but also all the other things that we think about and need to make sure happen when we operate the power grid. So we need to be able to um, have a stable grid that can withstand the fact that uh, supply sources and sometimes very large supply sources uh, uh, trip off suddenly or, or, or um, suffer, suffer contingencies. Um, and that has an impact on the power grid. And we need to make sure that uh, an event like that, um, an example might be if, if we're importing a lot of energy from uh, uh, BC and beyond and that, uh, that intertie that is carrying that energy suddenly goes offline, then that loss of supply in the system needs to be uh, made up for and needs to be sort of rapidly replaced. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have a stable system in that event. Um, we also need to make sure that things like voltage on our system it is uh, it, uh, that we have a strong enough system so that uh, you know faults and other contingencies on the system aren't uh, creating sort of wild swings in voltage and, and having negative impacts on the system. Uh, and so we're also uh, needing to assess those, um, and we're right in the in the middle of doing this more detailed assessment of some of the reliability implications of of the tr transformation of our grid, uh, and that work is going to uh, be released uh, later this quarter, uh, and it will talk about uh, you know some of the the challenges that we're seeing on the grid. Uh, that we expect to continue to grow uh, as the supply mix changes and um, ways that we can mitigate these um, these negative effects so that we make sure that we continue to have a reliable grid as we go through this transformation to a lower carbon um, uh, system. So I wanted to uh, get a little bit deeper into uh, some of the components of load and, and these get into um, areas that uh, I hope will be of interest to this audience in terms of um, uh, more residential type solar and electric vehicle uh, impacts. Um, and so when we were looking at uh, the impacts of uh, transition to a net zero economy, uh, we, we did uh, revamp our load forecasting approach and considered a number of other uh, drivers of electricity demand. And, uh, you know, tr traditionally electricity and demand in Alberta is driven by, you know, there's a certain amount driven by population growth. And then a lot of it is driven by economic activity. And that economic activity historically has been driven by um, the major industries in Alberta, and, and uh, not that oil and gas is the only industry, but it is a, a huge industry. And and um, as the oil and gas industry grew, that would impact uh, demand because of direct demand for the uh, operations, but also all the um, associated industrial activity that uh, was associated with it. Um, but what we see going forward as, as the grid electrifies is new sources of demand starting to, to grow. And that's really from the electrification of transportation, uh, the electrification of, of buildings, and it's really around the heating of, of buildings, uh, and the potential for new industrial loads, the production of, of new types of commodities um, and um, hydrogen is probably the top on our list in this category, but also uh, the electrification of other industrial processes to reduce their carbon emissions. And you can think of things like cement production potentially or, or other 
other industrial um, uh, activities uh, that might increase their consumption of electricity because they're electrifying and, and doing that instead of uh, uh, using fossil fuels. Uh, and so we started to uh, look at what the drivers of those load components were going forward in, in a net zero world. Uh, and so on the, on the transportation side, we, we, we wanted to understand what the implications of the federal policies around um, net zero or zero emission vehicles mandates and, and basically the direction that by 2035, um, you wouldn't be able to buy a internal combustion engine vehicle in Canada. And what does that mean if, if all of the uh, vehicles then were ele electrified uh, as a means of achieving that goal? Um, what uh, it might mean to, to fuel switch from heating um, and then these new industrial loads. So we built all that into our load forecast. Um, what what we saw when we when we do all that, we put all the puts and takes together. Some of the some of the things that we see slowing down is some of the demand growth from the traditional industrial sectors. We don't see that it was very likely, for example, that we have another large uh, oil sands like a, a new mine or something opening up like we saw throughout the early 2000s and even into the mid uh, you know teens of the of the 2000s um, and so that load growth is is kind of uh, maybe not declining initially but but uh, certainly uh, we don't see it as a source of, of new uh, significant growth uh, and that's being offset by some of these other sources uh, but what we do see is that um, it's really in the back half of the 2030s that we see the, the demand really starting to take off and reflect things like electrification of, of transportation and in particular heating uh, is when we see um, the real demand growth. So between now and 2035, uh, we see that, that uh, the demand growth is, is actually a little bit lower than the historically observed rates in the province, say from uh, you know 2000 to 2020, um, and then it's it's expected to accelerate post 2035. Um, so, what do all of these kind of factors mean for the day to day shape of of electricity demand in the province? Um, and so when you combine all of these factors where you've got increasing amounts of, uh, say, rooftop solar on, on, on households and, and on commercial buildings, you've got greater amounts of electric vehicle ad adoption. Um, what we start to see is uh, significantly increasing variability of the hour to hour and day to day uh, uh, electricity demand in the province. And so the bottom of the graph on the right shows you or gives you a sense of like in a non net zero world, uh, how the, the load pattern might be over a series of days. So this shows, I think about seven days in, in, in uh, January of, um, of uh, 2035. Um, so as a forecast, but what you see is, you know, there's basically a, a daily shape to load in the middle of the night. Obviously, demand is 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 low, and then during the day, in the morning, as as you know, people get up, go to work, industrial processes uh, maybe ramp up a bit. Certainly, sort of like commercial processes do. Uh, you see an increase in load, oftentimes in the in the evening when people are coming home from work, um, turning on lights. It's getting dark. People are cooking, et cetera. That's when we see our peak load of the day. But there's a fairly predictable daily pattern to that. Uh, what happens when you overlay then uh, the charging of electric vehicles uh, and increasing amounts of uh, uh, rooftop solar on people's houses, which really to us shows up like um, a reduction of, in their demand or a change in their demand on the system, 
rather than supply on the system, uh, it starts to change this dem demand pattern and make it much more variable. And so we, we need to, uh, as the operator of the system, uh, be prepared to, to deal with that variability on the system because uh, we are the entity that's um, directing supply to increase production or decrease production to make sure that we're always keeping that supply and demand in balance, the supply and demand on the system in balance. Um, I wanted to touch a bit on uh, electric vehicles and, and rooftop solar and what we're seeing in terms of our forecast of those in a net zero world. Um, so this, this gives you a sense of the potential electric demand that, that could come from the electrification of transportation. And we looked at uh, all segments. So the blue bar here is uh, light duty vehicles. So, you know, uh, cars, pickup trucks, uh, those types of vehicles uh, that that you and I would would buy and own, uh, and then there's mid duty vehicles, so uh, delivery trucks, things like that, uh, and uh, heavy duty vehicles, so that would be uh, large transport trucks, uh, and then and then buses, and so we broke it out by category and and uh, created a forecast of uh, what this might mean in terms of just average electric load on the system. And to give you a, com a comparator, um, by 2035, we expect load to be about 14,000 megawatts. So um, our total of electrification is uh, 730 megawatts of that 14,000. By 2040, you're at 1,200. So you know, not quite 10% kind of, of load in the province could be going to the electrification of transportation by this between 2035 and 2040 time period. Uh, and so obviously significant growth um, as we go through the rest of this decade and, and you can see it really uh, starts to um, you know, it displays a, an exponential kind of characteristic in the, in the 2030s. Um, obviously, that uh, electrification of transportation like that um, needs to, it raises the question of how are those vehicles going to charge? When are they going to charge? Is everybody going to go home from work, for example, and plug in their vehicle at the same time and, and charge it up? And so we have done a fair bit of work looking at other jurisdictions and all the information we can get uh, as to what these charging profiles might be because that can have a huge impact on how we think the system might um, be impacted by these vehicles going forward and and to what degree the peak load on the system the maximum load on the system might be impacted uh, and so this chart gives you a sense of uh, as we go through time both how the the volume of uh, charging increases through time and how th the potential range or variability or uncertainty of it at any point in the day uh, can change. And so on the bottom of this graph is the hour of the day. So it goes um, basically shows you uh, a, a whole day. Um, and the black line shows our expected average uh, uh, consumption for electric vehicle charging. And then the colored ranges show you the, the, the range that that could be in at any particular hour of the day. And so you can see as we get more and more vehicles on the system by, by 2035, that the average volume is certainly up, but also the uncertainty or the range is much wider. So, you know, we're trying to understand these things so we can prepare to be able to maintain reliability and continue to operate a reliable electricity grid as we uh, you know, see these changes in demand and the electrification of, of different sources of load. Um, uh, this shows you our forecast for, for rooftop solar or really, really all distributed 
energy resources or electricity resources. So these would be, this is supply that's connected on the distribution side of the grid. And uh, we see by far that uh, rooftop solar will, will dominate uh, this uh, growth in, in this source of supply. Um, and uh, you can see it, it really, uh, really sort of starts to take off from the, the kind of the mid 2020s out to the mid 2030s. Uh, it goes from what, 250 megawatts of, of total installed uh, capacity up to uh, 2000 megawatts in this particular forecast. And this is based off of um, uh, trends that we're seeing and the expectation that we might see policy supports for this type of technology. So this isn't necessarily an economics-based forecast, but we did think it was a plausible um, growth trajectory for this technology on the grid. Um, and uh, of course, you know, solar has a production profile and this similar to the chart we were just looking at for electric vehicle demand, this chart shows uh, the potential range of, of variability of production, uh, both in terms of the magnitude and the hourly variation uh, that can come from uh, those rooftop solar resources as we go through time. And um, so significant growth from 2025 to 2035 and a lot more variability that we're looking at having to, to deal with um, by the time you get to 2035. Um, we also looked at uh, different, uh, different sources of load from a, a building heating kind of perspective. Uh, we do see that that's um, probably not a large driver of load over the next uh, 10 or 15 years, um, but could become a significant source of load growth as we get into 2035 and, and beyond. And, and obviously we recognize that there, there's risk to, to these forecasts um, that uh, things may be accelerated, but uh, we see that there's uh, probably a lot of, of inertia just in terms of uh, the in installed uh, base of, of, of heating uh, in, in buildings uh, and that it may take some time for that to, to change over. And, and it, uh, right now there's sort of not really clear policy uh, support one way or another for, um, for these types of, of retrofits. So that, that could come later, but uh, we're seeing some some stickiness in this source of demand. Uh, so I want to end on uh, just what we're doing next and, and take some questions. Um, so what's the ISO? What, what are we focused on? Uh, we're focused on monitoring and, and participating in the development of of, uh, of carbon policy. In, in particular, the federal government's working on a clean electricity regulation, uh, and so we're. Um, uh, providing any insights we can from an Alberta perspective into that in how the Alberta grid operates. Uh, as mentioned, we're doing a deeper dive into some of the reliability uh, implications of the changing supply mix. Uh, we're also thinking about how this is impacting our energy market, our wholesale energy market, and other changes that might need to, um, or evolution of that market that might need to, to happen in order to uh, continue to uh, de deal with th these uh, changing dynamics and, and continue to have a well-functioning market. Uh, we want to understand a lot more uh, what the distribution facility operators or the distribution companies are thinking in terms of uh, what their projections of potential electrification trends are and the impacts of those so uh, we're, we're doing a bit more work there to see uh, how aligned uh, our thinking might be. Uh, and we continue to uh, examine uh, other scenarios around net zero. And uh, every two years, we do a, a long-term outlook, uh, which is a 20-year forecast out into the future of supply and demand. Uh, and so we will be uh, updating that outlook in 2023. Uh, and that outlook feeds into our planning process for the transmission grid. 
Uh, and so we will continue to incorporate these trends into our long-term outlooks and, and continue to take a scenario approach. Uh, so with that, I you know, want to thank you for your attention and hopefully we can take a few questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. That was really thorough and I appreciate it and you're sharing your information there on the screen. I'll just let folks jot that down because I'm sure there's going to be a few follow up questions. Uh, but then if you want to take your screen share down, we can see a, a big picture of you while we dive into our Q&A here. I uh, just want to remind folks that we're using the Q&A box uh, in the toolbar for questions today. So please enter your questions there and take some time to upvote other questions because I will be pulling from the upvoted questions. Uh, while everybody digs into the question and answer box, Kevin, I'm going to just start off with a very broad question. <laughs> you mentioned at the outset that there was significant risk that we may not achieve net zero electricity by 2035. Um, you know, given that we have outpaced the coal phase out goal that was set, um, we are on track to outpace the government of Alberta's goal of 30% renewables on the grid by 2030. I guess I'm wondering, don't those achievements give the ASO any comfort that we can get it done? Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a good point. Um, the, there are, uh, I think there's still significant challenges and, and we're not saying that it's impossible or anything of that nature. We're just saying that there's a, there's a lot still that needs to be done to go from where we are today to have a, a net zero system. And again, you know, 2035 is, is really only 12 years out. Um, and so there's a lot of investment that needs to happen um, there's still uncertainty around some of the technologies. Um, we, we did think about uh, and engage with stakeholders on the potential for having a, a scenario which had 100% wind and solar and storage and the by 2035. And the feedback we got from, from industry participants was that... Um, that was not viewed as a as a practical scenario. Like e even large developers of those projects said, you know, we we don't think that the 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 grid can only run on those technologies by that time frame. Uh, and some of our preliminary analysis indicated that too, from a reliability perspective. So we're going to need uh, all the technologies uh, that we can get. Um, and some of these technologies are are still in development. Some of them, have uh, you know longer approval processes, construction processes. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built. There's a lot of uh, regulatory decisions that need to be made. There's a lot of policy that's still uncertain. So there's a lot to do in, in a 12 year period. A, a long to-do list, yeah. yeah. I know, I, I think our keynote speaker a couple of years ago, Dr. Sarah Hastings Simon said, with the technology we have today, we can definitely get 90% of the way there, but we still need some investments to get the last 10%. So yeah. I definitely appreciate that there is this long to-do list. I see folks are now chiming in a lot on the question and answer. Uh, so I'm gonna jump to their questions now. And I thank you for that. Uh, Corey's wondering, does the ISO publish emissions factors for Alberta's electrical grid? Currently, the only data available for Alberta's grid comes from the Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, which appears to be outdated. And this emissions factor can have a massive effect on whether or not a project can successfully pursue a zero carbon design by electrifying the mechanical, mechanical loads in the building. Uh, so yeah, questions around emissions factors. I know we're all nerding out on your webpage on a regular basis. So we're just constantly, <laughs> constantly hunting around there for the latest data. And thank you for tracking the micro generators too, by the way. Uh, it's nice. It's nice of you to do so. <laughs> yeah, well, there. yeah. Um, so no, we do not post or publish that or estimate that data at the moment. Um, yeah, the, the the closest I've seen is some of the work that the the market surveillance administrator has done. And if you look in their quarterly report, their most recent quarterly report, um, they attempt to you know calculate some um, intensity factors and things like that. But uh, as the ISO, we don't uh, calculate that or post that data. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for that information. I, I know we get a lot of uh, folks considering investments here who attend our events and uh, from all over the world, actually. So <laughs> people are definitely uh, searching for information. I see a question here from an uh, anonymous attendee, uh, but I have a, 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 I'm gonna elaborate on it a bit as well. So could we not use, and I think you touched on batteries to smooth the ebbs and flows you discussed. So the generator needs would be more predictable. Uh, would this help lower costs? Would it also help increase reliability? And I'm actually just going to add to that because I think you touched on utility scale batteries, but I learned recently that a number of the distributors, um, they feel that energy storage is actually best placed in the community to help balance out loads where those loads exist, um, rather than all in the utility scale world. So I guess you mentioned the variability of residential solar, but you also mentioned the variability of utility scale solar. Is the ISO only considering energy storage at the utility scale? Do you see a role for residential and commercial solar um, uh, storage to contribute um, in the same way the distributors are starting to talk about that? Uh, so just to kind of flesh that question out on storage, I think we're all really curious where we're headed with storage. <laughs> yeah, and, and certainly we do see a role for for storage in in smoothing that production and and um you know when we looked at the reliability of, of a, that higher renewable case um like we had about four thousand megawatts of storage in in that case um and it, it was uh when we looked at having half as much storage, for example, we started to see some risks in terms of the supply demand balance. Uh, the difficulty that that we had when we looked at the economics of the storage was in um, in, 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 in sort of seeing uh, where the sufficient revenue would come from uh, for the volume of storage. And so uh, in the end, we, we had to make some assumptions that you know, there's additional revenue sources from somewhere to support that even that volume of storage coming into the market. So it, it certainly has a, has a role to play. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see where the technologies evolve um there are you know the, the costs are coming down uh, and and we factor in cost reductions uh, into our into our modeling as as uh, you know based on the projections that that we go through um and there's a potential for for new technologies to emerge as well so um yeah i think there's there's definitely benefits that it can provide um we've because of you know our our focus is a bit more on that transmission system side, the wholesale grid, um, but but certainly uh, you know you you could see that there are potential applications on the distribution system. Um, we are looking at uh, ways that uh, storage could be utilized to optimize the transmission system. I think the same kind of thinking could apply on a distribution side. So. Um, I think it's something that we need to kind of continue looking at as an industry as we as we go through and looking at those trade-offs between you know, what's it costing to put that in versus what's the alternative kind of approach to to dealing with that. So, mm -hmm. and then the question as well about where are the private investments going? Because it seems like the private sector is driving a lot of the investments when it comes to renewables so um so will they will they pick up the tab on the storage bill as well i guess is the big question yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're certainly they're certainly picking up the tab when it comes to solar and wind but it's it's not sure yet whether the costs will be there for storage i have heard from a number of utility scale wind folks that they're not doing any uh any new builds without storage now um so that certainly seems to be a trend um but i know there are still barriers in place to um, roll out storage uh, options for a lot of residential folks right now. So that's another area we're always learning about. We have a question here, I guess it's two questions actually, um, and not necessarily related actually. So um, I guess we'll take them in two parts, but they're written together. So how does the growth in wind and solar over the next 12 years compare to the last 12 years? I do remember you had a nice graph for residential, but I think they are maybe speaking more broadly. 
Um, I also recall uh, you, you had a graph saying it, it might end up generating as much as 40 or 45% of the grid uh, in the coming 12 years. So I think maybe you answered part of that after it was asked. Um, but here's another uh, question as well. Uh, methane gas generating is still playing a major role, uh, including cogen. Is the ISO banking on carbon capture, utilization and storage, or is this, and is that wise given its limited effective deployment, I guess, to date? Um, I'll add on that. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on how much we're banking on that? And if, if we're going to have, <laughs> I guess you had the three scenarios. I'm guessing one of those scenarios was pretty heavy bank on that, hey? Yeah, the, the, this, the dispatchable dominant one, I would say, um, involved more of, more of that technology. Um, I mean, we, we do see it, uh, as I say, we, we need um, on the grid um, some resources that provide those characteristics of being um, controllable or, or dispatchable both up and down. Um, having some certainty that they can produce in a wide variety of, of um, kind of weather conditions, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, our, our assessment was that um, given what we know about uh, the cost of those resources and their technical feasibility was that they seemed like the the most likely form of of that uh, generation to come on the grid and have the characteristics of of low carbon emissions um but uh, we we also did look at the potential for hydrogen um fired generation and obviously the hydrogen needs to be produced and and we did examine Is he freezing for you too, or just me? I'm not sure if I'm the only one frozen here. Oh, okay, I see other people. <laughs> okay, Kevin's frozen for you too. All right, so hopefully he'll sort that out and come back soon. In the meantime, since we're all having the frozen Kevin, uh, I'm gonna just uh, take a peek over these questions here and see if any of them happen to be ones that I've learned about recently. Questions about EVs. I will mention for anyone asking about electric vehicles, we do have an electric vehicle 101 session happening on Friday over the lunch hour. So please tune in for that to hear from the Electric Vehicle Association of Alberta. Questions about the market. Does Alberta's disconnected market mm -hmm. hurt our ability to encourage favorable customer behaviors? Interesting question. We'll have to see if he comes back soon. Does grid components, good question. Cost of capital project projects include the storage systems that don't exist yet. Time of use metering. Thank you, Rob. Oh, here he comes back. Good. Want to dig into some of those with us? Hi, Kevin. Oh, you're muted still. Hi there. Hi, uh, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I don't know if that was on my end or... Some, something went, but that's all yeah. right. Uh, you were just answering a, a, a meaty question and I appreciate it. Would you like to finish that one off or would you like to dive into the next one? I'm not sure if your brain has gone elsewhere in this off time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think we were talking about just uh, you know carbon capture and I was just saying like, um, in our in our modeling, we we did look for third party sources for the you know potential cost and operational standpoint. So, you know, we are aware that that is new and emerging technology, and that that is one of the reasons why we said, look, there's some there's some risk here. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know carbon capture is employed uh, in in processes now. It's uh, you know what's a bit new is the application of it on the back end of a, of a natural gas combined cycle power plant. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, you know, lots of research going into that. And we do have some proposed projects in Alberta. Yeah, absolutely. We hear about it all the time these days. 
All right, Lauren is wondering, um, does Alberta's disconnected market uh, where different companies, where we have different companies for generation, distribution, retailers, you know, we don't have the whole Crown Corp thing going on here. Uh, does that hurt our ability to encourage favorable customer behaviors? Why would a retailer provide time of use pricing, for example, to help distribution companies um, in this context? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so my thoughts are that no, that, that doesn't hurt us. If anything, that's a, that's probably an advantage for us. I mean, uh, we do have a deregulated market structure. And uh, I think, you know, right now what we're hearing just in terms of renewable development in general is that that's, that market structure is actually making it very attractive to come to our market and, and invest because we do have that openness. I think more specifically, to your question, um, what what the market structure does is it it does create incentives for companies that uh, do have those offerings to um, you know try to differentiate themselves and um, we're not you know we're not seeing that to date as much in the in the in the retail market in terms of demand response and things like that, but. We do see that starting to emerge in in other jurisdictions, uh, and that there are there are business models that um, uh, kind of through a combination of offering that to customers and participating in the wholesale market that uh, some of those retailers can can make a business case from that. Um, and so, I th I think the benefit of our structure is that it can drive those kind of innovations and, and different companies can try to package that up in different ways. Yeah, I think we're certainly the only market in Canada that, where you can have a power purchase agreement, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that has certainly facilitated a lot of private capital investment in renewables in Alberta. Uh, folks who are interested in learning about the power purchase agreements can come on Thursday. Uh, we are having a session on community generation uh, and Bow Valley is going to be chatting with us about how they have been enabling that through um, sort of micro power purchase agreements. So um, interesting opportunities we have here that it sounds like they don't have elsewhere in Canada. So um, yeah, thank you. Lots of great questions here. We have one about EVs and I was mentioning while you were away that we have an EV session coming up on Friday. Uh, I have to say it's one of our most popular. Uh, it's also getting the most number of trolls on the internet. <laughs> it, seems to, it seems to come with a high degree of controversy. Um, but how much more energy will we need if everyone starts driving EVs by 2035? I know your projections were that EVs sales would go up sort of after 2035, but of course, we now know the government of Canada, I think they maybe set this goal after your report was done. Um, they've said all new car sales need to be electric by 2035. So that would suggest that people might transition sooner than, than your estimates originally expected. So just this person is just curious, how does um, the energy we need uh, with the growth of EV, EVs compare to the growth over the past 12 years? Yeah, and so we did, we, we did model that that federal. Oh, you had it, okay. Yeah, and so what, I think one thing to remember is that, um, you know, there, there's a there's a transition period where e even though you won't be able to buy a new internal combustion engine vehicle, the, there's still a certain percentage of the fleet that will 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 be that. And so we we won't be for example, at 100% electric until many years after that mandate comes in. And I imagine there's a certain segment of consumers that are you know, probably gonna try to rush out and, and buy a buy a internal combustion engine vehicle for whatever reason, but right up until you, you can't. Um, so it's really, we modeled the proportion of, of the fleet that was electric through time based on some assumptions of how often do people turn over a vehicle and things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, so that is reflected in our in our load forecast there. That um, you know, on average, sort of seven to eight hundred megawatts in that twenty thirty five period, growing to um, twelve or thirteen hundred megawatts by twenty forty. Mm -hmm. um, that so that that in itself is that particular segment is high high rate of growth 
um, when we look at all the different components, we just see like that's being offset to some degree by high growth in, um, you know, the distributed resources, the rooftop mm -hmm. solar mm -hmm. as well, um, and general gains in energy efficiency and maybe less growth in some areas that traditionally had higher growth. Mm -hmm. um, it, but, uh, um, you know, that, that that's the other thing I was mentioning of why we're also very focused on the, the charging profile of those vehicles, because it's, mm -hmm. It's not just sort of the number of vehicles, but also um, how much diversity there might be in terms of when they're charging and how on the system. So mm -hmm. that that can make, uh, in a lot of ways, a bigger impact than even the number of vehicles. If you, if the charging profile is very concentrated, then uh, the impact on the grid becomes, uh, you know, much more operationally challenging. I would say. Yeah, back to the yeah. need for time of use metering that I see a lot of people mentioning here. <laughs> Going to have to maybe maybe need some regulations in that regard. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we did identify in our report that you, you know there's different ways that you can achieve it, but it is something that definitely I think needs some more work as mm -hmm. to um, how do you create some of those incentives to to smooth out that charging profile mm -hmm. and you know th there's different uh, as i say there's sort of different approaches you can take and there's i think yeah. a lot of different kind of micro experiments almost going on uh, yeah to, well uh, and of yeah. course the, the elephant in the room in alberta is things cost a lot if you don't regulate them and if you do regulate them they can cost a lot less so <laughs> depending on the depending on the uh, topic but i know uh, when you look at um green builds if you want to accomplish those through incentives for example that can cost the system a lot of money uh, but if you regulate them <laughs> theoretically it's just costing the purchaser the money so uh, pushing it onto the private sector so anyways lots of lots of interesting and uh, controversial controversial subjects so i applaud you folks for even dabbling in this at all because i know it's uh it's one of those areas where as soon as you jump into forecasting uh, the policy folks come out to, <laughs> come out to play so so here we go we've got i'm gonna i think i'm just gonna ask two more questions because i want to respect your time and we are over here uh so i'll just ask this next one here and then i'm gonna wrap up with a nice broad one uh that i've got prepared for you uh is hydrogen generation really an option option worth considering i think we were talking about um ccus earlier now this question's about hydrogen um, when it is effectively non-existent today, I think there are a couple of projects going ahead, but it's not really something um, that we've heard a lot about. Um, batteries are a more proven technology. Uh, even nuclear is, is technically more proven and, and here, you know, also more clean when it comes to carbon, uh, arguably more controversial in parts of Alberta. <laughs> but yeah, just curious if, if what your thoughts are on hydrogen and how it factored into your uh, calculations. Um. Yeah, so a few things. I think I think when we do talk to um, to turbine manufacturers and 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 they are focused on um, on uh, working out the engineering to have that work. And so th there's there's no there's no sort of real fundamental barriers to to getting hydrogen generation to work. There's some engineering that needs to be done. Um, you've got to figure out, you know, the source of the fuel and get it to the plant, et cetera. Um, but there are some benefits to it in the sense of like the combustion itself is, is zero emissions. Um, the, the facilities, if they burned hydrogen, uh, theoretically have a lot of operational flexibility. Uh, that maybe you, you don't get with say something like a, a nuclear generation facility, which probably wants to run fairly steadily or uh, e even a, a natural gas unit with carbon capture that maybe needs to run in a bit of more of a steady profile. Um, and so th that dispatchable capability up and down um, may be a benefit of hydrogen. Uh, a hydrogen fired unit on the system also provides um, 
what we call inertia to the grid. So just the fact that you have a big physical turbine spinning provides a uh, benefit to the stability of the electricity grid, um, which we're still kind of working out whether storage can provide that to the same degree. Um, and, you know, and so ultimately it will also become a little bit of a, of a cost driver too. So, um, in, you know, in some applications, I, I think people are looking at hydrogen because um, in some industrial applications, you know, maybe it, it's a fuel that burns hot enough that uh, if you're not, you can't electrify certain things. And so there's probably a certain demand for hydrogen out there and production out there as well. So um, I think what we're trying to recognize is that, again, there are a lot of different pathways and there's still some uncertainty and some of this is, um, yeah, costs are still being worked out. Um, relative economic benefits are still being worked out. Um, and uh, it, it's not entirely certain or clear which, which way it will go or what will emerge as the best solution. And and probably in the end, it will be a little bit of everything <laughs> will, will make yeah. sense. But, well, yeah. and it's interesting too. Um, I appreciate that you folks are studying some sort of the trends and noticing the trends towards uh, renewables and towards um, energy storage and all these things, because uh, certainly from a solar Alberta perspective, our, our most popular course is, is always the energy storage course where, you know, if people are really wanting to, to hone their skills in that they're hearing the demand. And we actually brought in a whole, a whole heat pump presentation to the solar show this year. People say, well, that's mechanical, not electrical. But I tell you, that's our number one question we get is how do I get a heat pump and can my solar installer give me one? So it's interesting how these trends are, are taking shape around us. Um, and some may be accelerated by factors completely out of our control, uh, such as uh, warfare. Uh, it's fascinating how, how many people uh, started calling after um, you know, the war broke out in Ukraine and, and people started thinking, we need more energy independence. And, and they started thinking heat pumps, solar, EVs, all those things. So, uh, so you can do your best to predict, but I guess there's a lot of uncertainty and where the global conversation will go. I just yeah, want to end on, oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Sorry, there's just one other thing I want to say about hydrogen, which is, you know, we, we also think about what we call the resiliency of the grid or um, the fact that, you know, sometimes we do get two or three week long sort of cold snaps and things like that. And um, I think one of the challenges with energy storage is the duration of the storage. And can you, can you ride out or do you have enough to make it through those kind of extended periods? Um, mm, the climate uh, and the climate yeah. adaptation components to that. That's an yeah. interesting point. Yeah. yeah, because obviously we're going to have more extremes on, on in both directions. So yeah, interesting point. That's actually the extreme weather conditions that you're talking about. It's another reason we get all the calls about heat pumps because people are saying, well, I'm going to invest in an air conditioner anyways now because of all this extreme heat. I might as well do a two for one, <laughs> get myself a heat pump instead of bothering with uh, with an air conditioner. So it's interesting to see how those weather extremes are probably impacting individuals calling us, but also your modeling. I'm just going to end with one final broad question. Um, and you may or may not be able to comment on this, but I always like to ask how we can help. So, you know, I wonder if the ISO is in conversation with the feds and requesting some support to build out our interconnections to BC. You know, we talk a lot about battery storage today, but I think we all know that interconnections and transmission lines are a really important component of our transition here. And I'm really just wondering like how Solar Alberta and our friends can help advance conversations around those interconnections, around those interties, you know, what can we do to get that conversation started? Because obviously um, the provincial governments don't seem to be having that conversation, but as civil society, how can we, you know, help the ISO and others to enhance this reliability through regional uh, stability planning? Yeah, so that's just an easy question to end yeah, with. Yeah, <laughs> just to end with, uh, but really, like, how can we help, Kevin? You know, because you you have, there's a long to-do list here, and yeah. you have you have this audience ready to help here. And so, you know, if if, if you could say, you know, why don't y'all just, uh, yeah, like, ask some, some government for some 
transmission money or something like that you know what what would be your your dream that we could help with <laughs> yeah and and so it's you know the the iso is ultimately tasked with with implementing sort of our mandate and our policy and so um we don't necessarily make the policy so i i think yeah. you know it, it, certainly talking to the right people talk i mean if you're interested in that kind of thing i think you know, talk talk to the policy talk to the policy makers um yeah. we you know what what helps us certainly is is understanding and getting as much information as possible about um you know the trends that you're seeing in terms of of costs uh, maybe some of the challenges um that 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 you're seeing because that helps us sort of make better projections to understand issues better um and so you know if i would leave the audience with one, one thing it's sort of um if if you have information that you think would yeah, be sure. valuable for us to know or to consider um you know we're always open for um, getting information from a whole bunch of different sources so that we make sure that we're you know considering all of the different factors um mm -hmm. as we think about the future and how things operate and yeah. So in yeah. increase that information sharing. And I mean, mm -hmm. as the number of micro generators grow, I know we're often seen as uh, the little guy because we serve a lot of micro generators at Solar Alberta. But um, over time, we'll probably need to be in dialogue with you in this to the same degree that some of those larger system operators that you talked about at the beginning are probably in dialogue with you because uh, I think a lot of the micro generators hope to be major contributors over time. So Hopefully we can keep this dialogue going. We sure appreciate you coming to the solar show today. Last year we had the wire providers here. We had the GOA here. We had the AUC here and we left saying, why didn't we have the ISO here? <laughs> <laughs> so I got in touch with you guys right away last year and I just appreciate you and your whole team, um, you know, committing to this uh, almost a year ago and following through with it. Truly amazing. Uh, despite all the turnover you've seen and all the change you've seen this year, the fact that you were willing to follow through and start this conversation uh, with all these little guys today. I sorry to call you little guys, but I, I think compared to the folks you're used to dealing with, our audience often constitutes the the little folks. So, <laughs> um, so really appreciate that. Uh, we are hoping to be big players in the future, and already some of us are are making a dent on our electricity system today. So really appreciate you taking the time to have that conversation with us. I uh, want to thank City of Edmonton one more time before we wrap up here today. And I'm seeing a lot of thanks for uh, Gateo Betty, uh, Miss Betty, our elder today as well, for setting uh, the tone so nicely for our solar show. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you to all of our audience. Uh, we're looking forward to chatting with you all throughout the week. Um, come nerd out with us every day. We have sessions at 930 and, and noon. And uh, we'll hope to see you again, Kevin, and, and continue this dialogue with the ISO. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. And, and thank you to everyone for for your attention and for all the great questions. Awesome. Thank you, make Heather, sure, for having make me. Make sure before we leave, Kevin, that you look at all the nice comments in the chat because everyone's appreciating you. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. You're getting appreciation. <laughs> it's always awkward when they can't express it themselves, but there we go. All right. Well, with that, we're going to say adieu. And thank you for staying late, I should say. Sorry about that, Kevin. Our audience was super engaged. <laughs> yeah, good. That's great to hear. All right. Thank great. you, everyone. Well, I'll end there and have a great night. <laughs>